Okay, so now we're going to be on the fifth page of our review guide, and we'll actually be starting on Unit 3.4. Um, on Unit 3.4, we were actually looking at DNA technology. And so one of the first things that we wanted to look at was genetic engineering. If you notice, again, you do want to pay attention to these objective sentences. It says that we need to be able to summarize how transgenic organisms are engineered to benefit society. So again, we're looking at Unit 3.4. This is where you'll want to be at on your notes. And we're talking about genetic engineering. In genetic engineering, we end up making or producing a transgenic organism. To be a transgenic organism, let's define that first. A transgenic organism has DNA from another source. would actually glow. What scientists did is they actually engineered the DNA of that organism. And they actually took the DNA from a jellyfish that glows and put that into the DNA of the marmoset. And that's why when you put it under a light, the marmoset would have um, little glowing feet. So in this diagram, we're actually going to see how we do genetic engineering. So this is a diagram of genetic engineering. And the idea is that we're going to join the DNA of two different organisms to get one of those organisms to either produce a trait or produce a protein that we want. Okay, going back to unit 3.3 when we're talking about DNA and protein synthesis, DNA helps code for proteins. Proteins code for traits. And so whatever we do to the DNA, it's going to affect the proteins, which affects the traits. So in this picture, we have two types of cells, a bacterial cell and a human cell. From the bacterial cell, we take a plasmid, which is just the DNA from the bacteria, circular DNA, and we cut it with a restriction enzyme. Um, and here, from the human cell, we're actually taking out a gene for insulin. So when we're describing the process that occurs, the first thing that we do is we identify gene of interest. So basically, we pick out the gene that we want. The second thing that we do is we cut with restriction enzymes. And we actually end up cutting both things. We cut the plasmid, the bacterial DNA plasmid, and we cut the insulin gene with the same enzyme. That actually allows us to produce a fit or an end that can fit together. The ends that are made are called sticky ends. And you just need to know that that means that we can put them together or combine them together. The third thing is once we've cut them, and now they have a way of fitting together, we can actually combine the DNA from both organisms. That's now called recombinant DNA. So first things first, we get our gene of interest. We find our gene of interest. Second thing, we cut it to get the sticky ends that we need. Third step, we recombine them together. And the fourth, we'll put the recombinant DNA into host organism. We put it into the organism, and it makes the protein. In this case, because our gene of interest was insulin, now the bacterial cell that we use to host that DNA is going to make insulin. So recombinant bacteria produces insulin. 
It's really important that you know that this is mainly how we make insulin for diabetics. For diabetics. Next question asks you, what is the value of this technology? Why is it so important? Well, in this specific example, um, we can make insulin a lot faster. Okay? They used to have to take out the pancreas of a cow or pancreas of a pig and grind it up to get the insulin out. Now we can get bacteria to do it in the lab, and because bacteria can replicate themselves, make copies of themselves so quickly, we can get a bunch, thousands of bacteria making a little bit of insulin all the time. Next question, what are some applications of this type of technology? Again, with this, a lot of scientists are looking into how can we use this for gene therapy, okay? How can we change the DNA in a human or give them a gene, perhaps, of insulin so they're actually able to make their own insulin and won't need the insulin for their shots anymore. This process can be used to make GMOs. That stands for genetically modified organisms. A lot of times that can be something like food. What are some of the ethical issues surrounding this technology? We worry about things like allergies. And we worry about um, those organisms actually taking over or harm, harming natural organisms. Okay, the organisms that normally live in the area. That could be a plant, that could be an animal. Um, moving along. Sections is to evaluate some of the ethical issues surrounding the use of DNA technology, which includes cloning, genetically modified organisms, stem cell research, and the Human Genome Project. I want you to go back to your notes, or you might need to do a little research on your own, very brief research, and answer these um, five questions on your own. What I want to do is actually move on to the next section to the next section with you. In this section, we're actually starting to look at unit 4.1. And in unit 4.1, we're looking at evolution, the theory of evolution. Remember, in very general terms, evolution just means change over time. And initially, we start talking about the change of cells over time. In the first question, it said, what did Louis Pasteur contribute to our understanding of the organism origins of life? Louis Pasteur showed us in his broth example that life did not come from non-living things. So life. Um, did not start from non-living things. His example was actually the broth. Okay. If you remember, he had two flasks, kind of round flasks like this. In the two flasks, he had something like chicken broth in it. In one of each of the flasks had a little S curve on them. He broke off the cap of one of them. When he broke off the cap to one of them, um, dust particles, things from the air, were actually able to fall into the broth. In the other flat round flask, the S-shaped curve let oxygen in, but other things could not fall into the broth. The one that was broken open would have microorganisms growing inside of it, like little fungus, little mold growing inside of it. The other one did not. So that proved that it wasn't just something in the air that produced those living things, but something, um, literally something, something microscopic was in the air, not the air, the oxygen gases itself. Um, the second one was explained Miller and Uri's hypothesis. Miller and Uri's hypothesis is in this picture. And what they did is a little different.
right? It's actually counterintuitive. These two kind of um, are opposite of each other. The Miller nerve basically proved that organic compounds like proteins can be made from inorganic compounds. They recreated Earth's early environment. In here they had water, they had gases and chemicals that were found in the early Earth conditions. They used lightning, electricity to power the system this mechanism, and they're actually able to produce some protein. That showed us that, okay, at first we didn't have anything that was living, we did not have a cell yet, but in early Earth's atmosphere we can produce things that were necessary to make those cells. And so this was some um, evidence towards the theory of abiogenesis. This is abiogenesis, and this is biogenesis. Um, why did Miller put those particular gases into their experiment? Because they were found in early Earth. Early Earth. Main chemical or main gases, carbon dioxide. Um, methane, CH4, lots of different gases that are generally And the next question, what type of organic molecules did they find? Again, mainly proteins. And what is their significance of their experiment? It shows that A, biogenesis is how life may have started but life now continues through biogenesis. All right. So again, make sure that you go back and you can that middle section of our review, middle section right here. Um, and then we'll actually complete this portion in class. If you're not going to be in class, then you do need to complete that next portion by yourself. Make sure you remember to do your summary sentences.